Hello everyone and welcome to part 3 of this nightmare of a book review and analysis. If you are here, this either means you were able to survive the insanity of part 1 and stomach the blob of mucus that was part 2 or you happened upon part 3 too soon. In any case, if you haven't already, definitely watch parts 1 and 2 and come back if you want part 3 to make any amount of sense. This book is a tragedy and so are the people who wrote it. This video will have points to skip to in the description as well as the comment section for mobile viewers like last video because what you are about to hear is explicit. I will not be covering any more titles written by the Pearl specifically unless it is heavily requested by you guys. This book was a hell of a lot worse than I thought it would be first going in. It started off stupid and then just escalated so quickly it caught me off guard. The inhumanity kinda dies down towards the end, but nowhere near enough to be comical like part 1 was once again. However, it does end with some stupid nonsense much like it started off with. Allow me to demonstrate. If anyone is wondering where the idea to starve your kids came from in this book, it would be in chapter 15. Those of you who are brave enough to check out the archive may be wondering where exactly this is said. Well, they talk about using food as a coping mechanism being a gateway to sin just because the first sin ever committed involved eating. Mike then claims he's not trying to define the cause of all fatness, even though he totally is, and says that using a pacifier or a bottle to calm a crying baby is going to make them an alcoholic, a smoker, or something of that nature. When you keep this in mind and consider how the pearls treat children, it all begins to make sense once you put two and two together. For anyone who didn't catch this when reading, I certainly don't blame you. I actually had to reread the entire book and reread chapter 15 a few more times before I finally figured it out. They keep what they're trying to suggest very vague and in the dark, and it's not hard to see why. If you outright suggest starving kids to punish them, it looks bad, and then people are going to out you for child abuse. Well, surprise, Mike and Debbie, you're getting called out for child abuse. Not because of this chapter, but rather for the rest of the book. It's like they know what they're doing is messed up, and they're attempting to conceal the fact that they're doing it to look good to the rest of the world, a true mark of a textbook narcissist. But we all know what's up before we even reach chapter 15, so trying to mask another method of abuse when you've clearly stated all the others in earlier chapters makes this method of trying to cover your ass completely pointless. As if the earlier chapters with actual parenting advice slapped in weren't pathetic enough. They didn't even fool us with chapter 4 and its respect your child malarkey because we know they never actually do any of that. They never follow any parenting advice that doesn't cause a child stress, pain, resentment, self-doubt, or all of those things. They just like to feel in control and have to control the lives and actions of others because they aren't satisfied with controlling their own. For people who say that modern gadgets makes you envious of others, they do seem to use the internet to their advantage. Not only do they have their own website, they have a YouTube channel. Don't send these idiots hate mail, they'll enjoy it too much. I wouldn't even recommend leaving a review on their Amazon listing because as of this video's production, I found out via Kiwi Farms that every time controversy on this book rises, they send a bunch of their followers to write positive reviews, and you can tell these accounts are sock puppets or created just for the purpose of reviewing the one listing because they have no post history outside of the one review. The only other people on the internet I've seen pull stunts like this often have their own threads on that site, and I am shocked these guys don't even have their own law cow wiki page or farm thread because they'd be perfect candidates for the horror cow tag. On the topic of bullying, let's move on to the hypocrisy of this chapter 16. The funniest part of this chapter is simply within the first paragraph. In it, they say one of their house principles is, if it's not fun for all, it's not fun at all. There are so many things wrong with this, I don't even know where to begin. In theory, this concept is a good mechanism to make sure everyone gets along, until you consider that it's being used by narcissistic psychopaths to their advantage. They decide to do another roleplay scenario where they guilt trip a child bullying his sister by essentially comparing him to Hitler. I wish I was joking, but an actual quote from the book reads, Son, you know Hitler and his men had fun when others were suffering. They laughed while boys and girls cried in pain. Do you want to grow up to be like Hitler? Even if you're trying to teach your kid not to be a dick, why would you say this? There's a huge difference between kids being unpleasant to each other and killing over 6 million people simply over not fitting your social standards. They actually put this in their book and thought this is an okay thing to suggest and say within this context. Another reason if it's not fun for all, it's not fun at all being used in this context is problematic is simply because of what the pearls themselves do for fun. They abuse children. 
Once again, they fail to practice what they preach, and this chapter, as short as it is, is just another expression of that. Mike then goes on to call his cringy roleplay great training, projectile vomits a reason as to why he's right in his broken mind, and ends the chapter. In chapter 17, they say using God as a rod or using the Bible as a punishment or means to threaten your kids into complete submission will create God-haters. Yes, I'm serious. They actually tell us not to do the exact thing they are doing by writing this book and recommending these methods to others. These methods do not make your religion look good. They do not make you look good. If anything, books like these are just as quick to turn people away from religion as using religious beliefs as a punishment. That's pretty much what these methods are in the first place. They then go on to say never to use the Bible as a way to teach your kids about weaknesses and where they need to improve, because then it will make them hate religion as well. They also say that keeping religion and discipline separate will make the kid feel less watched and graded. I'm sure using these methods will arouse those feelings anyway. Even if you take the religious tones and aspects out of this book, what you're left with are ways to abuse your children and damage your relationships with them far beyond repair. Mike then goes on to say that as a kid, he hated going to the principal's office because the principal would paddle disobedient students, and he had it happen to him a few times. This gives you an idea of how old this guy is and what he may have experienced as a child to make him this way. He uses it as an example of how the parent is associating negativity with things they shouldn't. It would be a good example if this wasn't how the child would be viewing their parent if said parent treated them like this. Mike even admits he himself didn't like it at the time when it was happening. Probably because he wasn't the one doing it, nor was he in control. He wasn't having fun when it was happening. Gee, maybe he should refer back to chapter 16. Just a thought. This chapter tells us not to make religious show-offs out of our kids. They compared parents telling their little kids to recite Bible verses and prayers because they're cute to a dog doing a trick in front of a group. Mike then calls his dog inbred for not doing a trick in front of the family and making him look dumb. They then say what is a dog good for but to elevate his master as if we don't already get the implications about kids and dogs from earlier in the book. They then say when kids do cute things they should be totally ignored as if the parent isn't allowed to be proud of them. They say the same thing about parents showing off their kids for their talents. If the kid forgets how to do something they're good or talented at because they're under pressure, the parent's act falls apart and the kids are a disappointment as a direct result. I get not being pretentious, but the point falls flat when you consider a dog can deliver a devastating blow to Michael's already bloated ego. It really doesn't take much to make a narcissistic personality feel bad about themselves. This chapter just lets us know it's so easy you don't have to be a human to do it. Mike's gripe in this chapter is that homeschool is the only way to properly educate your kids because apparently the public school system is an automation factory. More like because child abuse is harder to keep up if a victim has access to people outside of the family they can seek help from. A common trait of abusers is the fact that they tend to isolate their victims to prevent them from seeking help from others and to create an illusion of dependency on the abuser. This is especially common with narcissistic personalities who have children they're abusing. They will create a false sense of fear to keep their kids dependent on them so they can continue to exploit them, and sadly in a lot of situations the kids are none the wiser until someone intervenes. With that being said, the Pearl's distrust and tinfoil hat opinions towards people in society meant to help shows exactly how unhealthy they are and it shows the lengths they are willing to go to keep people they view as less than them dependent on them. This is manipulation at its finest. The Pearls don't bother doing research on things like Planned Parenthood or anything like that. They demonize them all equally just for being opposed to their insanity and the spread of it onto others. It becomes clear later in this chapter that the Pearls think people should breed like rabbits and they shouldn't have any aspirations outside of exactly that. Because apparently Hollywood is a better teacher than you will ever be to your kids. I get that the education system in America is garbage. But I think people like this are also part of the problem since they continue the cycle of abuse they were raised with like it's nothing and their children follow suit because they don't know any better. This is horrifying. And then they go into positions of power, and I think you all know what happens after that. Mike and Debbie each address their kids of corresponding genders with a letter, both of which make up the last two chapters. They are long and droning, but here's the TLDR of both letters. To Mike, divorce is a foreign concept. Because of course his sons will be fathers, their families are only as good as their marriage situations. Apparently they have to keep their wives quote unquote happy, but those same wives have to be unnaturally cheerful and are not supposed to show any emotions outside of this. It doesn't matter her background, she's not allowed to be unhappy with anything ever. 
If her dad was abusive, she's not allowed to hate him for it or talk about what a lazy or crappy person he was, because then she's going to say the same about you, even if you're nothing like him. She's not allowed to have any ambitions outside of being a wife and mother, so if she's an independent and stable-minded person, avoid her. Also avoid her if she doesn't want kids, because kids fix everything and she's miserable if she doesn't want them. Also give her breaks sometimes so that she doesn't feel like she's doing all the work while you get the Kodak moments. Also let your kids play with hammers and nails. Yes, really. Be involved in your kids' lives or else they're going to think religion is for women. Your wife should also have to discipline the kids so you're not seen as the bad guy. Also never give your kids sweets because then they won't want anything else. And let them go without shoes or essential things they need until they get a job. Don't buy them toys unless it's something you can warp their brains with, such as a baby doll or a toy truck. Don't let your kids watch TV or develop interests of their own. An ideal Christian family is one miserable and stuck in the Stone Age. Also, something something Bible. This may sound like satire, but this is the short version of Mike's letter to his sons. The way he views women is absolutely disgusting and isn't much different from how he views kids and animals. Tools meant to be used and abused by you, the possessor of a penis. If you are a dude and are also repulsed by this, you have every right to be. The only place I have seen posts or written media that is anything similar to this are the snippets I have seen from subreddit incels while it was relevant. Debbie's letter is no better and is in some ways worse. While I waste two whole paragraphs making Bible references, remember to be a hidden woman and not develop your own opinions, let alone any that oppose your husband. Be your husband's slave to his every whim because that's obviously what makes a happy life. You are not allowed to express being mad at him for any reason because if you do, your kids will do the same to both you and your husband. Begin abusing the kids the second they're born because if you don't, they'll rebel against you and or run away from you and never look back. Also have a place in the home where no kids are allowed. Spend time with your husband there while the kids play with the hammer and nails you guys gave them. This letter is much like the chapters in the book written by Debbie, nonsensical ideals bundled up in Bible references and other garbage with little to no substance to expand it and make it look bigger than it actually is, just to make it look like it has a deeper meaning than it actually has. This is just a bigger and more dressed up version of what he said. They both could have saved us all time and just said, read this stupid book because these letters to you kids are just a rehashing of the entire damn thing all over again. And this doesn't include the conclusion of the book, which is simply this. We did this to our kids and it worked. Also, the Amish do it, so it must be okay. We ran out of ideas, so we're going to go over the points we already made throughout the entire book once again. The rest can be thrown away with little to nothing being different about the book without it. That's all there is to the ending, so let's move on. Finally, I can put this book to rest and not have to look at it again for what I hope will be a long time. What a disgusting piece of non-literature. This book is a literal bullshit sandwich, insane and stupid ideals with horrific and scary methods in between. The Pearls had to open their own publishing company to churn out their pitiful excuses of books just because nobody else was crazy enough to do it for them. Unsurprising. The only thread on Kiwi Farms I found that mentioned these guys outright was a thread on the Quiverful Movement, a religious cult that believes in breeding entire villages in one home because apparently vaginas are clown cars and women's physical and mental health does not exist. They abstain from using birth control and contraceptives, thinking all kids are a blessing from above, and we as humans are therefore obligated to produce as many of them as possible. The most notable families involved in the movement include the Maxwells, the Duggars, and apparently the Pearls. Many people on the thread who have interacted with people in Quiverful describe the kids as maladjusted to mainstream society and unable to think for themselves they simultaneously push their parents' agendas on as many unwilling people as they possibly can. I read a few pages of the farm thread and felt immediately sorry for the kids in these situations, especially the girls. They had their aspirations and dreams crushed by their families and their unrealistic expectations just so they can keep their cult and customs going. Some of these families do not celebrate holidays or birthdays either, nor do a lot of them approve of or allow their kids to enjoy normal activities one would view as leisure or fun, such as going out with friends, going to the movies, playing video games, watching TV, going on vacations, etc. The Quiverful Movement deserves a video all on its own, and I'll end the video here so it isn't too obscenely lengthy. 
Thank you all for watching if you made it this far. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe if you like what you saw and wish to see more like it. If you didn't like this, I certainly don't blame you. Feel free to file a complaint on my Discord server or on my other social media outlets, all of which I have linked down below for you. I will also be linking the self-help sources from last video in the description as well, so check them out if you need them. And I'll see you guys in the next installment. Stay safe and take care.